Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your usual host, Glenn Kaiser. But today, I'm handing that responsibility over to my colleague, Tom Graham, the head of Dolby Vision Content Enablement. As you can probably imagine with a job title like that, Tom interacts with some of the leading post-production colorists working today, and he put together a really interesting roundtable conversation recently to discuss the state of HDR video and what it's like to work on projects in Dolby Vision. So without taking any more time away from that interesting conversation, I'm gonna hand the keys to the car over to Tom and let him take it away. Welcome everybody to our new episode of the Dolby Institute podcast, and it's for video folks. Um, it's been a while since we did our first two episodes, and uh, today we want to continue our conversations with colorists. It's a series that really isn't limited by time or format, and uh, we're focusing on colorists and their experiences creating and storytelling in HDR, wide color gamut, as well as really using the Dolby Vision tools and workflows. Um, everything's game. We can uh, cover cinema and, of course, home and mobile uh, tools, workflows, deliverables, tips. Um, we really want this to be entertaining, educational as well. You know, we've got some really cool guests today. I'm excited to have these guys. We've been longtime friends. They've been supporters since the beginning. Um, and I find them as very real world, great uh, knowledge sharers. In fact, they have a really cool uh, website that uh, they partner to create that is really focused on educating people um, called Mixing Light. So I'm, I'm sure that's going to be one of our first uh, topics we dive into. So guys, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I love this is going to be kind of a really fun roundtable that, that really focuses on incredibly good audio microphone performance. You guys all <laughs> sound great. So, so say hello. Introduce yourselves if you could. Sure, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Robbie Carmen, uh, and Tom. Thanks. I, I agree with your sentiment that uh, we've been friends for a while now, and it's always always fun chatting with you and the in the incredible team at Dolby. So we're excited to be here for sure. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Joey. Hi, I'm uh, Joey Deanna. I'm a colorist in Washington D.C. And yeah, just like Robbie said, you know, we've been working with. Dolby Vision and HDR since kind of the, the early days before not everybody was really talking about it. It was really early adopter stuff. And we've been, you know, once you see HDR for the first time, you can't help but be super excited to work with it. So we've been like just working as much in HDR as we can ever since then. And it's just been fantastic. I love that. Patrick. Hey, Tom, thank you very much for uh, inviting all of us here to talk with you about our experiences on Dolby Vision. I'm very excited that I actually have an experience of Dolby Vision to talk about. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a, located out of Orlando, Florida these days, originally from New York City. I also have a, a, a weekly newsletter, freetowofcolor.com, that focuses on the craft of color grading. And I share out a lot of stuff like this. Uh, to my readers every week. That's great. And, you know, I'm really excited too that we just got to partner more recently and and help you on your journey on your new project. Um, I will also point out that this is kind of like the ring of the Atlantic Ocean, right? We have, <laughs> we have Joey and Robbie sort of in the Maryland, D.C. area. Then we have Patrick in the Orlando area. And of course, Dan joining us from the UK. Am I correct on that? Dan? Oh yes, yeah. So I uh, I live in Bristol, which is the west coast, and then and work in London for pretty much all the the bigger long form projects. Um, cool. So Dan, tell us a little bit about you. And uh, you recently had a a Dolby Vision experience. I correct? did. Uh, so I am mostly commercials colorist, um, but I've always kind of dipped my fingers into long form. Um, and I guess my last Dolby project was maybe two years ago. So like it was great to have a great break between my first experience and my first kind of trim past and then revisiting it again uh, and this time it was a narrative project called no one gets out alive so it was shot by Stephen murphy amazing friend of mine from back in ireland and uh shot on venice and we we had to do theatrical sdr and hdr so it was it was kind of everything thrown at me in one go um but yeah it's it's uh, the trailer should have dropped by now so yeah if you can check it out you'll you'll see how dark i made it <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It, it's a love story. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> cool. So, um, Joey, I kind of liked where you kicked it off. Um, 
and in your comment about really HDR, once you sort of see it and experience it, you know, you, um, you're sort of changed forever, right? And you really want to explore and work in it. And I know, Patrick, you had sort of that gap too. And your, your first immersion back in was on a project that's a really, you know, I kind of think of it as a budding sort of growing genre, which is the sort of stage shows at, uh, you, you did this uh, Disney Broadway hits at the Royal Albert Hall, which is coming out on Disney Plus soon. And you had done it originally in SDR a bunch of years ago and were able to revisit it. So tell us, maybe kick us off on your new immersion back into HDR and and that experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've like everyone else on this call here, I, I've been a huge fan of HDR. I, I remember when I saw my first HDR display, and I think Robbie and I were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, that probably that first HDR display was probably a thousand nit display. And it just, to me, it had like this uh, almost 3D look to it. It had this depth and it was just beautifully shot. And uh, it was at NAB when I saw it. And ever since then, I was just totally hooked. And uh, so, but, uh, HDR for me is more than just about HDR 10 and brighter pixels and all of that. It's it's what you've done with Dolby Vision, your team has done with Dolby Vision, the notion of being able to replicate creative intent on all of these different screens is really what gets me juiced about this whole process. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we actually, uh, Robbie and Joey uh, hosted a 10 part or was it a 12 part series at the Dolby Institute? Um, I helped direct and edit that. And so, you know, I've been involved and excited about uh, this whole process for almost half a decade now. And, but, you know, a couple of months ago was the first time I actually got to do, and it was a revived project. It was a theatrical, uh, um, you know, sh literally shot on, on stage, a stage performance and uh, 14 cameras, uh, all of different types of cameras. It was a, it was, it, it was a little bit of a challenge the first time I did it. Certainly a challenge this time around is I had to layer in this whole new lingo and visual experience. So it was a great way to kick it off. I, I was really excited. And I kind of always knew in the back of my mind that that show was probably my most likely first Dolby Vision project I'd ever do. And I knew this five years ago. And uh, I was not surprised when it popped up. I was ready to give my recommendation when when the director called and said, we think, you know, Disney Plus wants this in Atmos and uh, Dolby Vision. So That's great. That's great. And, you know, that you bring up a great point. I How remiss of me to not thank Robbie and Joey and yourself for really doing those sort of bite-sized videos that I know have been so helpful to people sort of exploring what does it mean to get involved in Dolby Vision, understanding things like the ECMU or the ICMU. Much thanks to you guys for producing those videos. I think they're they're extremely helpful. Robbie, tell us tell us your HDR journey and how you're you're here and now and Yeah, I mean so, you know, I think like, you know, obviously I'm gonna echo everybody else. Like HDR is here. I mean I, I think when I think about the HDR conversation, I always harken back to the unglorious, really difficult days of 3D, right? And everybody was making this push to do 3D everything. And it was all negative disparity stuff, you know, out in front of the screen. And I looked at that back then and I saw, you know, the kind of industry racing to do that. And I was just sort of like, this is a fad. Like this is not, it's cool and it has its place. You know, I thought theatrical 3D was pretty cool, whatever. But in terms of pushing the ball forward of image quality in a lot of ways, that was taking a step backwards, right? Because, you know, left eye, right eye, it was, you know, lack of resolution, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, similar to Patrick, um, I remember being at NAB and going to your guys' booth, right? And at the time, you know, it was a prototype of the Pulsar or something like that. And it was back, you know, behind this mysterious shroud of black, you know, duvetine in the back of the booth. You know, and you had to you had to be invited to go back there and look at it. And yeah, from that moment on, I thought to myself, look, I, I can see the path forward for the HDR conversation five, 10, 15 years from now and how that's going to get better. And I think that excited me then. It still excites me now. And I think, you know, the conversation that I am most excited to talk about when it comes to HDR is not just bright pixels, right? Because you can get anything bright. We've had the ability to have bright TVs for the longest time, right? That's not, that's only a part of the equation. I think what's most exciting to me about the HDR conversation, particularly about the Dolby Vision workflow, um, is the conversation about better 
images, better data, right? More of it. And that includes wider color gamuts. That includes uh, more intelligent tone mapping. That, as Patrick said, that includes the ability to better represent artists' intent throughout the entire pipeline, no matter where that image is going to show up, right? And so, you know, I looked at that from a, from a business, as a, you know, as an owner of a company, I looked at that several years ago. And as you know, Tom, I invested early, right? Like in a, in a very speculative way. I remember talking to you and being like, well, Okay, Rob, well, you're going to need this ECMU and you're going to need the license for this and license for that. I'm like, I'm all in. Let's do it. Right. I had no, no, no HDR clients at the time. Right. I was literally just saw this as something that was a continuation of what I saw on the show floor of NAB. And now I finally get to have it in my own hands. Uh, and since then, you know, we have worked very hard to offer HDR to the masses, if you will. I think when HDR first started out, it was very rightly so. You guys were taking the biggest and best companies in the world and experimenting on them, right? And seeing what they could they could knock for. And, you know, eventually that trickled down to, you know, people like Joey, Pat, Dan, and I, you know, testing these workflows several years ago. Uh, and I haven't, we haven't looked back. It's been, it's in, it informs every decision that we make about suggesting to clients about workflows, about finishing and really adding value to their work. And so, yeah, I, bu I bought in early and I'm still still totally on board. I love it. And, you know, there's a lot, lot to unpack there that I think is super insightful. One of them is, you know, if you're talking to, say, a producer or somebody and, you know, they – they kind of bring up the 3D conversation or, oh, this, is this a fad or is this a gimmick? And and I think that what I've heard you all sort of say in that sense is really, this is completely different than that. And it's, it, again, it's not about totally brighter pixels. It's about better pixels. And it's about, um, you know, a, a more contrast ratio, a wider color gamut that the cameras are already capturing, right? It's already really there. And, you know, I, I think what Dan... Um, and and Robbie, we'll come back to your monitor purchase too as as well. I want to I want to unpack a little bit of that. Uh, but but Dan, one of the things that Robbie said that kind of um, inspires me is it's not about brighter images. So you just did this this uh, horror film for for Netflix, and it's a darker movie. There's 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 benefits to Dolby Vision and HDR in shadow detail in telling stories in a in a darker way correct yes yeah 100 percent um i would say that we never would have had this movie approved if it was an sdr only <laughs> like it, it's it's incredibly diffusely lit mostly it's like moonlight but because there's specular lamps and there's a lot of depth to the image so we didn't have to choose between brightness and uh color volume we could have both it allows us to kind of keep like the whole kind of level quite low but still have that kind of perceptual sharpness i think with just 100 nits to play with it would have been essentially in the mud it would have been kind of like very squished um and that was one thing we were kind of worried about when we would get to the sdr version uh but luckily we essentially analyzed the whole thing and watched it and it had got us like 90 percent of the way there so it was kind of like a a little bit of an experiment but uh it turned out quite well thank god that's cool um and you know, um, back to the monitors question, Robbie and team, what, uh, cause, cause really that is a big expense for someone wanting to get started, right. Is getting into the HDR reference grade monitor. And, you know, as you sort of all are involved with training other colorists and, um, such, what do you see the monitor landscape looking like or evolving to, um, as this, as, as you said, Robbie, it's moving towards the masses now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's it's a complicated thing, right? And especially where we are now, pandemic, supply chain, you know, all that kind of thing. I, I wish I had the, I could pontificate about exactly what the near future holds in terms of in terms of monitoring, right? Um, but I think the guys will agree that you know the the very central argument or not argument, but discussion that people have in HDR is not about its value, really. It's not about, oh, that looks great, right, or whatever. It has to do with the the mathematics of buying reference monitor and buying HDR monitor, right? And it's a question that we get all the time, right? And and as I said, you know, when I invested in I did it speculatively and knowingly. I bought a, you know, whatever it was, 40 grand, $45,000 monitor at the time. And even just, you know, less than, what, Joey, two years, we've seen that price of those kind of monitors go down to, you know, the top end monitors down to 20, right? Yeah, I bought it's, the same monitor for 25000 
Right, exactly. And so I, I do think that there, we are moving in the right direction. And I think, you know, the one thing I do want to say, and, I don't, and I'm curious about Pat and Dan and Joey's thoughts on this and yours as well, Tom, is I do think, unfortunately, there is a little bit of like an elitist attitude when it comes to some of this stuff, right? Like you see people going, well, you can only do HDR work if you're using, you know, whatever these monitors. And I would just like to say from our team, we obviously – uh, talk about the benefits of true reference monitoring and all the reasons to have true reference monitoring, right? But I, I personally feel that that is, should not be the sole limiting factor for somebody to experiencing these workflows, learn these workflows, and get ready for these workflows. Is it true that you might have some limitations on, say, uh, you know, an o in a WRGB OLED like an LG or something? Yeah, there's some limitations right there. But can you go through the workflow, experience it, and, and get an understanding of it? Absolutely, right? And I think it would surprise a lot of people, you know, um, you know, doing that, how fun it can be. I mean, I, I say this to the guys all the time, too. Like, to me, the biggest thing about HDR grading is that grading's fun again, right? I think it used, I think it was so much, so much so, like, okay, go into the suite every day, lift gamma gain, little saturation, lift gamma gain, little saturation, window here, right? When you start grading HDR, it's like a whole new world opens up to you. And I don't think that that necessarily has to be monitor dependent at first. I think you can experience those workflows, get that um, that funness under your belt, while at the same time understanding the limitations of maybe some consumer monitoring and work your way up if your clients and your needs deserve that to get to true reference monitoring. Yeah, I mean, I would say, especially on the monitor subject, uh, you know, I kind of speculatively invested in a reference quality HDR monitor as well. And I am very happy with that decision, you know, a year later. But the reason why it was so important for me was because even though had having graded in HDR and do, done some HDR projects, I didn't feel like I had my creative eye in, right? There is just no replacement for time in the chair, working with images, trying to figure out the aesthetic, the actual artistic side of how can we use this technology to help tell a visual story, right? You know, we can talk about color management and the technical limitations of the displays and all that stuff. And I do think that, you know, reference quality monitoring is incredibly important if you're going to be, you know, charging big money to a client for a high quality HDR finished product, you know, but if you want to just try out some HDR workflows, absolutely use your consumer LG because then you can at least start exploring that artistic side of it, right? And, you know, I think when people first start grading HDR, we've all had this problem. You know, there's a tendency to, to just turn it all the way up and be like, oh my God, I can make it like, oh, I can go brighter. I can go brighter. I can even go brighter. And, you know, figuring out the right amount of restraint for the creative aspect of each project is something that you cannot do without experience. And it's like you can't do without working with the footage. So the, the quicker you can get into and start playing in HDR, I think as an artist, the better you'll be down the road when everything is HDR. And I'm confident that that is going to be the direction of the industry. Yeah, and Tom, I would think that Patrick has is uh, is almost a perfect example of this, right? For years and years and years, he's listening to us talk about HDR this, HDR that. You know, he's come to he's come up to our facility in DC a few times, and oh, okay, I see how it works. Let me get some stick time with it, whatever. But now, you know, he was kind of under the you know the deep end of the pool to jump in. And I'll be honest with you, all of us, you know, just you know, on our just casual conversations, we're like, we're you know, we were nervous for Pat, right? But I think Pat can 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 also say that it that process you know while he was thrown into the deep end of the pool it's largely about learning the visual language of hdr right and there's no substitute for that learning of that time and you know i would say for anybody who wants to learn that it takes some time right and having you know that experience on something that might not be reference quality still i agree with joey still helps you build up your language skills if you will of of hdr yeah when it comes to uh the reference display. I mean, this is a conversation the four of us have been having for, I mean, a decade, decade and a half when it comes to reference displays in general. Forget about HDR. How about when we made the move from NTSC and PAL into HD and then there was a whole new class and then we will move off of CRTs onto LCDs and then, you know, OLEDs. And, and so there was always this the new technology is always very expensive and there's always this tendency for professional colorists 
to make a big deal about the reference display, and I believe that's rightly so. Uh, the way I like to explain it is that the ones and zeros on our hard drives have a meaning, and a reference display is an accurate representation of those ones and zeros all the way through the grayscale, all the way through the color space, right? And, and that's what you're buying with that reference display. And if, like me, you're going to be mastering for the first time, color grading for the first time for a Disney Plus, or you're going to Netflix, you're going to any of these big streamers, it is incumbent upon me that I accurately represent to my client the type of equipment and the reference environment that I'll be in when I'm mastering that content. And so delivering to Disney Plus, I absolutely would not be doing it off the LG that's behind me here for the client display. I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable about that. It's not a, a reference display. It's not what they're buying. And so I had to travel to a facility that had a proper HDR display that I could then make intelligent, informed choices. And those choices would be recorded onto the hard drive the way I was seeing them with my eyes. And, and that's kind of how I generally deal with that question. And I think one thing to add here when it comes to the reference display is that it's important to remember that HDR and specifically PQ, which Dolby Vision is based around, is fundamentally at its core a different way of encoding, transmitting, and displaying an image than we have before. And this different way of transmitting and displaying the image does rely on the end user's monitor to do some tone mapping to its capabilities, right? And all of that, you know, downstream playback on the consumer devices is done on the assumption the algorithm is built, ah, <clears throat> excuse me, the algorithm is built on the assumption that you did master to the standard, right? So yeah, if you are big money client paying for a finishing job, absolutely. The reference monitor is an indispensable tool. But, uh, you know, like me and Robbie were talking about earlier, just, just getting in to explore the workflow and get some experience, you don't need to write a check for $40,000 to, to get started. And, and Tom, I'll say one last thing about this that I think uh, Dan can concur with, right, is that, you know, right now, also, it's, it's, it's hard not to look at the landscape of HDR monitoring and just go, okay, it's in flux, right? You know, and that's everything from the technologies that are being used, you know, you have, you know, full uh, local array dimming systems, you know, that can go very bright, you have um, LMCL panels, you have, you know, OLED panels, you know, you have a wide range of panels, and there's preference to it, too. I mean, we've talked to a lot of people, you know, for example, Joey and I are both on these uh, LMCL displays, right? We talked to a lot of colors to go, oh, I can't use that, you know, because of the motion, you know, motion artifacts or whatever, right? You know, Dan, you've had that experience where you, you own an LMCL panel that is very similar to, uh, you know, OLED kind of in terms of its performance, right? You, you've probably looked at an LMCL panel and gone, oh, I don't like this, right? I mean, so that monitoring is different. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite a set and forget colorist. I like to essentially like set it up once and then and go for it. And I found uh, the LMCLs are just quite suitable for the, the nature of, especially with kind of twitchy DOPs. I always found like what they see on there, there's no options, there's no changing. For me, it was kind of like the, the, the easier option. But I found like you guys have mastered your monitors so much so that, you know what mode it is. You can kind of hedge the the questions before they come up, especially if you have foot switches and uh, stream decks that you can just kind of swap the flanders over pretty much instantly. I mean, Tom, I, I don't know if you know this about Joey, but Joey's a real big car guy, right? And, you know, I, I think one of the things about HDR monitoring that I, I think is a good analogy and it's, it's apropos for Joey is that, you know, a lot of these monitors are like driving a manual car, right? You have to like, you have to be in control of it to make it happen. And that might be, you know, that might be intimidating to some people for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'll just throw in one other um, intermediate step, basically between what Joey was sort of describing of getting your, your feet wet with a calibrated consumer TV panel, basically, is that new middle tier of say four to $6,000 uh, like the Apple XDR or the LG EP950 display or the Asus, something like that, where it's it's got more control. There, It's sort of a higher level panel. It may still have some issues. It may not hit sort of the recommended peak brightness of a thousand nits, but it's good enough that you could do the majority of the work, say, at home on your own system 
and then take it to a reference display somewhere Absolutely. else and maybe finish your project in a much better And we're already design, seeing right? the cost of those technologies go way down, right? Like we're seeing 2,000-ish zone local dimming displays that perform very well around that $5,000 price point. And we're starting to see five, 600 nit top emission OLEDs hit the market soon too, again, around that $5,000 price point. And that's great for two reasons. One, it does let you get a lot closer to a reference quality HDR image, but also it opens up the opportunity for things like editorial and VFX to get HDR monitoring. And I think that's really important because if you have people doing VFX that has things like diffuse lighting and shadows and stuff, you're going to want to see how that looks in HDR. And HDR is going to affect editorial decisions. It's going to affect how you pace things, how you choose shots. So getting some HDR monitoring in the hands of the editorial world, I think is great. So seeing the prices of this display technology keep coming down is, is fantastic. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the sort of the other pieces to the puzzle where VFX workflows will save you time and money if they start sort of working in HDR, at least checking their work on one monitor before it leaves the facility. That, that's a great point. Um, you know, if we could just jump to color grading systems now, I know if I'm correct, it's resolve, 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 base light. Correct. Am I? Yep, that's right. So Dan is our base light user. Great. That's, that's really cool. And you know what, um, in terms of, in terms of how you approach HDR and, um, what's needed in the color grading equipment, do you guys approach anything differently there or is it pretty, pretty much the same system? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty much the same, you know, the same system. I mean, I think that, you know, hand in hand with HDR stuff is that people are shooting on, you know, largely beefier formats and things that are a little bit more, you know, intensive for system resources, right? So, you know, it's going to, obviously you're shooting, you know, 8K red or, you know, whatever, that's a little more intensive than, you know, shooting on a DSLR or something, right? So that's kind of go hand, kind of hand in hand. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, from an equipment point of view, no, I haven't really had to change much. Um, I mean, the big change for us has been, you know, transitioning from a couple of years ago using external, you know, the external tone mapping, you know, the ECMU, right? Uh, and, and shifting to, you know, the internal CMUs, which all these systems are now, um, are all supporting, right? But that's actually been awesome. Love that. Love that. I don't have to have an extra box in the rack, you know, uh, do, doing that. Um, but no, it's large, largely the same. I mean, I think the same rules in terms of performance and, you know, GPUs and all that kind of stuff apply to the HDR conversation as they would, uh, you know, the other, you know, other conversations. I mean, I, these guys know me, I'm always bigger, badder, more of it, right? If I can do it, that, that's what I want to do. I was just going to say on the topic of the color grading system itself, the one thing that I feel is, is really important to wrap your head around, whether you're working on, you know, base light resolve or anything else out there is that color management works so good for HDR, right? If you're the kind of colorist that for years and years and years, just turn the knobs until it looked how you wanted it to look, that kind of workflow might not be as, you know, conducive to HDR again, because we're, you know, we're displaying the image in a different way. And all of the modern grading systems now have very good color management architecture built in. And so you can go from camera space to a wide intermediate grading space to the display space very fluidly with all of the math working well and without losing any data along the way. So understanding the color management in your grading system can go a huge way to getting you a good starting point for your HDR grade, right? So if you start at a good point, you know, that's, that's going to make the grade easier down the line. And I do, th I do think that that's a hard thing for what I refer to as a lot of craft colorists, you know, to really kind of gronk, you know, uh, in, especially in larger facilities where you might have engineers and assistants doing a lot of this project setup and, the, you know, the math involved. Uh, I think all of us will say that, you know, getting our heads around the color management pipelines of these workflows took a little while to do, right? It's not, it's not a simple thing to understand you know, all these transforms to understand the alphabet soup of ODTs, IDTs, RRTs, you know, whatever, you know, OOFs, EOTFs, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I think we've tried to do as a group and, you know, with, with Mixing Light too is kind of 
demystify a little bit of that, that acronym stuff and talk about these workflows um, because it is a learning process. And I think, you know, I think all of us will agree to the point where a lot of the times when we're explaining this stuff, especially to our audience, it's because we're going through it at the exact same time. And so it's a little bit of a cathartic thing to go, okay, I have no idea what OOF, EOT, you know, whatever, you know, the acronym means. I'm going to do the research for you guys and we'll have a conversation together. And I think that's been a big sea change that we've seen in our little niche of an industry and color grading in the past couple of years that has been forwarded by HDR stuff is that all of us are way more intelligent in 2021 about the math and the transforms of these pipelines than we were 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I walked into a room, there was a panel, it was lift gamma gain, saturation and hue, and I'm done, right? And now I'm thinking Now I'm thinking in terms of all of the various transforms and how to maintain image quality and what gives me the most flexibility to go you know, from this to that. And it's, it's, it's much more complex than it used to be, but also much more exciting. Like image fidelity is something that I don't think anyone can argue has improved on all levels so much over the past decade. And I think that's largely in part to all the really smart people who've done all the thinking behind the math. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point. And I know, Patrick, you sort of had your recent experience where you're taking, you know, the beauty of working in PQ and HDR is you're taking log images from the camera and you're working in a log space. And, you know, I heard you guys sort of have this conversation before where, it, you know, SDR is so much of a let's fix it and squeeze it and fit it into this gamma thing versus HDR, um, you know, maybe getting people to think outside the box and say you don't necessarily have to start power windowing everything right from the, the, the get go. You know, you have you have this logarithmic image in this logarithmic space and it pretty much sits in a way that you're in a good starting point. Was that where you were going, Patrick? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that in my experience, at least the, the the one show I've done so far, which again, a stage show. Yeah, I mean, there was, uh, well, you know, the, the, the restrictions on color grading when you're doing a show like that, uh, you know, you've got 1200 shots and you've got five days to get it done. And by the way, I'm also doing the SDR derived and a 600 nit version. Um, you don't have time for a lot of power windows and you really hope that uh, what they were doing on set, um, how they shot it, that the intention is all there already. And so if you have to do anything, it's to accentuate something or it's to fix a problem. Uh, and, and you're not really required to do a lot of fine-tuned detail on a, on a show like that, right? Different than a commercial world. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And but just to circle around for a moment, because when we were talking about hardware requirements, I will say one thing, and then I'm curious to hear about Dan's experience on Baselight, which is on Resolve 17, I found that prior to Resolve 17, I was not really big into color managed workflows. I found that in earlier versions of Resolve that its built-in architecture always had felt like I was working under some sort of limitation when I was working like project-wide color management. And with Resolve 17, they introduced a new color management scheme uh, and some color aware, color space aware tools. And all of a sudden, you know, for Resolve 17, it just opened up that whole world for me. And I've really this year really gone all in on color managed workflows. And so for me, the timing of this project coming around coincided, coinciding with Resolve 17 couldn't have happened at a better time. Um, so that's the one thing that I would say uh, I was lucky on, that I didn't have to fight a lot of these things that Robbie and Joey had, had been fighting for years and Dan when he did his first job. But Dan, on Baselight, uh, when you were putting your Baselight system together and you're thinking about HDR, was, are there actually, were there design considerations in rigging out um, your computer? as it related to HDR or was it just, no, nah, I just pick my base light system. It'll cover that. Uh, I think you do have to a little bit. So I have a base light one at my facility, which is it's incredibly fast for most things, uh, especially cause I do short form. So like that would be the standard system that I would say like at least 60% people have, uh, we're at X2X creative, uh, in London where I do the features, they have a base light too, just because 
we're always working full resolution, which I guess like Sony Venice is 6K. We're always, uh, or EXR files. So you do need to be able to like, you know, analyze a film quicker um, and throw noise reduction on without the machine suddenly starting to grind. So I think like if I was doing narrative 24 seven, I would have went for the next spec up. Um, and with film light, you essentially have to buy one or two systems. It's like, do you want a base light one, a two or a 10? Like, it's not like you can pick and choose the the elements, which kind of makes it easier because when I break it, I can ring them and they fix it, which uh, I'm sure they're sick of me sometimes going, oh yeah, I think I broke it again. <laughs> um, which was a, a big thing for me actually as well. I was, you know, trying to get into the more long form world so to, to have the support contract is quite handy to be able to talk to people like Andy. He works uh, at Filmlight and if you have a stupid question, he's pretty good at digging you out of a hole. And if, if it's really bad, he'll send you a video saying, do this and it'll all be fine. Um, and Dan, you... You used an ACES uh, color managed workflow for your your project. Yep. Yeah. So uh, essentially, we would take the Sony Venice. So it was uh, uh, what's S Log three Cine. I think that was the kind of main shooting profile, uh, and then everything would go into ACES, and we would uh, work ACES all the way. So any VFX poles would go out, uh, you know, as linear EXRs in camera space, so we could bring them back in. Um, and yeah, it was it was very slick. I found like. Uh, ASUS is a little Marmite for some people, but essentially like it shouldn't actually affect the way you grade too much. You just kind of get used to it. You have to spend a lot of time working on it, but I feel like now I could grade any project any way and it'd be fully color managed. I think you'll probably find like a mix and light podcast from four years ago where I'm saying, I'll never be color managed. I'll always be free. Uh, and now I'm the opposite. Like I, I guess moving to film light, I learned fully color managed. I learned the tools work better when you play the game and, uh, like I, I, I graded a concert film maybe two years ago and I graded it all with one layer of base grade because every camera was color managed perfectly. We did a little gamut compression because we had blue stage lights and things like that. And essentially from that point, it was like up, down, a little warmer, a little cooler. And that's what kind of convinced me that like to work that way is is the way forward, really. I, I don't think I could go back. You know, you know something, something's funny that you said earlier, Tom, and uh, uh, the great the great company three colors, Walter Ropato, I've heard him say this many times, right, about respecting the original cinematography of the work, right? And I always kind of scratch my head about that because I was like, okay, of course he's working with the top DPs in the world, you know, with, you know, you know, 30 ton grip trucks on every setup. And here I am, you know, working on, you know, whatever, some reality television show and not, nobody's respecting, you know, nobody's respecting anything with this kind of shit, right? Um but I will say, you know, one of the things that's happened, I finally understand that in the concepts of HDR, right? And you, you had said a moment ago that, like, kind of things just fall into place, right? It's less, you know, kind of forcing the image. Uh, and I really feel like it's a weird thing sometimes when you're grading uh, HDR content to feel that way because – so much of my value as a colorist, right, is understanding how to squeeze and manipulate and adjust that image to get it to work in an SDR pipe, right? And now I'm like, okay, well, I'll just do some printer points here, maybe a little contrast, and we're done, right? It feels, it feels, it feels like almost like a betrayal sometimes, right? You're like, what, am I really doing anything to this imagery, right? <laughs> can I, well, can I play counterpoint sure. to that just for sure. a second? So. The way I pitch it to people is if if you spend three days on a one hour show, you're probably going to still spend those three days, but your colorist is going to be more sure. creative yeah, yeah, with yeah, that yeah. time. And you, you can explore more options and, and things. Whereas instead of fix it work where you're trying to, you know, take a 15 stop image and squeeze it into six and a half usable stops, there's a lot of stuff you have to deal with that's just... Um, fix it work for for lack of yep. a better term right and and i think i think hdr um you know as as you sit down new creatives in this process i'm sure your job is you're a shepherd to walk them through and help them to to realize the best best possible version the biggest you're in the biggest sandbox the, the most colors that you can paint with but obviously you have to make creative choices and make make the right choices so I will say it's it's kind of freeing when you first start, especially working in HDR, but also working color managed where, like Robbie said, we've been, I, I, I like to think of it as, you know, we've been kind of beating the images into submission, into that like six and a half stop, you know, tiny little container. We're squishing things and we're squishing things, trying to get the maximum amount of highlight detail or shadow detail for whatever we want for the image. In HDR, you don't really have to do that. 
And that does let you focus more on the stuff I really like to focus on, which is the creative side of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's let's shift a little bit towards the Dolby Vision process and um, sort of, you know, once you've created your HDR image, uh, you now move into the Dolby Vision analysis and and then sort of looking at that mapping now. Um, you know, Joey and Robbie have done enough projects in CM29 that the earlier version of the mapping and now, and now pretty much everybody's sort of shifting to 4.0, which is this better starting point. And, um, first question I have for you guys is, um, with the ICMU output, do you guys believe in having a separate second monitor? So an, an SDR rec 709 target monitor or do you like to work with a single monitor ah man this is a philosophical <laughs> question we've I think, had many right? discussions <laughs> yeah. about this I, we've had many discussions <laughs> about this um i mean look i think that it's up to i, I think one i think it's up to the particular colors and the preference about how they do that um you know i think early on in this thing you know doing this work i wanted to play you know to mimic the the dolby playbook as 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 much as possible you know so i would go out you know went out to california and visit you know shane regary there in sunnyvale who's you know an amazing colorist works for dolby and you know walk in his room and he's got 47 monitors on at the same time you know all at different all at different trim you know all at different target levels i'm like wow i want to emulate this um I think early on, I think I was really keen on the idea of separate, you know, SDR or, or I would just refer to as downstream monitoring involved in the room. Uh, I think I think I have mainly driven by client response, shifted a little bit of off of that actual live working side by side thing, uh, and used side by side more as a last. QC step, right? So in other words, I would do the HDR grade, I do the downstream grades uh, separately without the HDR as kind of a, a monitoring viewpoint. And then before I'm all done, yes, I would turn the HDR back on and look at those trims just to make sure I didn't make any stupid bonehead mistakes and everything translates. Um, but it's largely about preference. I, I personally have found it really hard to make the transition from looking at a beautiful HDR image that I love so much and is amazing, amazing, amazing to what is a really good SDR image, but just admittedly doesn't, it lacks the sparkle, if you will, that the HDR images has. And doing that, that at the same time, I found that I've actually, I'm less efficient. And I found that just, you know, uh, doing it as a separate time and then using the, the dual monitor as a QC pass is kind of the way that works for me. Very cool. Patrick, you want it, since Joey's kind of in that same camp, I think, with, with... Yeah, so I have spent in my entire career a total of 15 minutes evaluating my two choices because <laughs> uh, I was on a deadline. And so take, I'll just take it for what it, that represents. So what I walked away from was the problem I had in the side-by-side -side is I had a 32-inch uh, HDR reference display next to a 24-inch SDR, and I couldn't... I could not get around the size mismatch. I just found myself being unable to do like a one-to-one, -one, switch my eye to the second display and just do this one-to-one -one mapping, right? I had to kind of resize the image in the smaller display. And then like, does this, it got too, it was too, there was too much mental overhead. And I found that I just felt freer the moment I turned off that SDR display. Now, thinking about it, once I got out of uh, the heat of the battle and I and we had this discussion, uh, you know, the team here had this discussion internally, I, I wondered and I posited if maybe one of the advantages to the side by side is if the person doing the SDR derived version, if it was graded in HDR and they're doing the derived version, if that person is different than the original colorist, then I could absolutely see the value when you're doing that trim pass of having both up at the same time. For me, as the colorist who is mastering, I did the original master, when I switched that HDR display into 100 nit mode or 600 nit mode, I didn't need that SDR display to tell me what my initial intention was. I had just done it the day before or three days before. I knew what my intention was, right? And so it really, I, I, could, I could for myself judge if I was getting out of this uh, what I originally wanted to get out of it. So that's kind of my take on that, you know, from that 15 minute experience. 
That's great. And I think, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes is usually enough time for to make that gut choice. And usually you, know, you pick the right one, usually. So, Dan, how about you? Uh, I'm a big fan of the single monitor. Um, and I think the reason it was so successful for me is something that uh, Robbie said before I started. Um, when we went from HDR to SDR, we uh, analyzed the whole movie and then we watched the whole movie before we trimmed just to get our minds into SDR land and, you know, make notes of like, um, the DOP actually, Stephen was wonderful. He saw that the HDR is the master. A lot of DOPs are like, SDR is what people will see. He wanted to have the same wow factor in the SDR if possible and where possible. So our goal was just to write down every time like a red felt like it wasn't, you know, feeling the same or the speculars were getting a little bit clippy or kind of like less saturated. Uh, and I found that process really enjoyable, actually, that we were we were watching the movie as a movie again, rather than let's sit down and grade the scene again. That's always the, sometimes the hard thing. And I, I feel like if I had the dual monitors, the DOP would still be kind of craving some of that color volume uh, from the HDR. So it's it's great to kind of focus us on the SDR and then we can you know find that same tool that makes them happy and you can really dial it in quite quickly. To Dan's point, I, and I think this is something that a lot of new people in the Dolby Vision workflow find um, challenging or perhaps at worst they misunderstand what it's meant for is that like trimming is you know the trim controls are not the same thing as grading the show right they're they're meant they're meant to provide a better translation of the image to whatever the downstream target is right but it's not meant to be a replacement for like you know actually grading i think a lot of people are like well why can't i do power windows in a you know in a trim why can't i do you know keys in a trim right I have found, and I think uh, talking to a lot of other colorists, is that, um, you know, and Dan had this experience on the Netflix film. He, he told us several times, right? If you spend the time to do the HDR grade and focus on all the things that matter in that grade and you focus on doing it the right way, actually the downstream stuff becomes really easy and really straightforward, right? You're, you're trimming some stuff here and there, just whatever. But I have found that like more times than not, when I'm sitting there looking at the SDR vision and I'm touching every single shot and I'm trimming every single shot and I'm making a lot of changes, that's more indicative of something that's not quite working in that HDR grade, right? And maybe I should go back and revisit that. And nine times out of 10, it's Oh yeah, my APL was at like two thousand. Of course, it's not going to work, you know, in an SDR or whatever the case or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I think that's just an important tidbit to understand for people who are new to this is that the trim controls are not a substitute for you know getting the grade right in the first place in the HDR version. I will say this on the subject of kind of the dual monitor workflow versus the single monitor workflow. I do like to switch it over to SDR and, like Dan said, watch the whole thing just in the derived SDR by itself. But one of the things I have found that I really like to be in dual monitor for, and this is why I've actually recently upgraded my home suite to have dual monitoring capabilities. I got the bigger deck link card. I got a calibrated SDR monitor on my desk for this exact reason is that the 4.0 trim controls, when you get into color volume mapping, as in in the HDR, you might have had some really bright, saturated reds or yellows that aren't translating exactly how you feel is right into the SDR. Those new six vector hue and saturation controls in the 4.0 trims that really primarily are there to get you a better SDR version. They don't do much to your like 600 nit or 1000 nit downstream HDR playback, but they can go a huge distance to getting you a much better derived SDR. I feel like when I'm working with the hue versus hue or the hue versus sat trims, having the HDR and the SDR up at the, up at the same time is way better for that. So I do like having the option to go both Sure, because you're seeing that P3 red and you're now seeing the Rec 709 red side by side and you're able to bump this one to make it fit as best as possible. Exactly. And depending on the shot and the creative intent, it might be, okay, I'm going to make it a little bit more orange in the SDR, or I'm going to make it a little bit less saturated or more saturated. Obviously, the SDR can never have the HDR P3 red, but now I can have a creative decision of how to handle that. Yeah. And I just to kind of um, echo what Robbie was just saying, and he mentioned earlier in, in this interview that uh, when I as I was prepping for this, you know, Robbie and Joey and Dan were like giving me like, you know, rah, 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 and make sure you do this and think about that. And I think the two things that really helped me the most when it came down to the SDR derived version was 
two bits, bits of advice I just want to emphasize here because we've already said them once. One, watch it down first. Don't stop at the first shot that you see a problem with and start mucking with it. You need to get a sense of overall how did the software analyze the image and overall bring it down because you will start to notice patterns and then rather than being feeling like, oh, let me switch over to the HDR and regrade this, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. I do this trim or that trim control, and that'll solve this set of shots for me, right? It has to do with the derivation. And that's what watching it down the first time gets you is a sense of how the software was operating. That was really, really useful. And the other bit of advice that was really useful was trim controls are not grading, 100%. You know, the trim controls are there to help, uh, you know, tr trade offs have to be made when we go from a really, really bright, saturated color like I had on the concert film. You get these really neon lights and they get mushed down into SDR. The problem is the software has to make a choice between are we going to keep the brightness or are we going to keep the color? And I found that uh, the Dolby Vision process, the, the processor tended to pick go in one direction and consistently. And I found that, eh, no, let me take it the other direction. I want less color, more brightness. And so that's, that was the, tr and now that'll change from show to show, I'm sure. But um, those were the two bits of advice as to don't go back and start regrading an HDR. Now, what I, I actually broke that advice on my last day, I had everything done. I had four hours left. And on the finale, I felt like in the HDR version, I'm like, this is HDR. This is the finale. There are fireworks going off here. Let's have some fun. And, and then I really finally, at the end of five days, I let myself relax and I versioned out that scene and I just graded it to look the way I, f I wanted to feel. And I was smiling and I was cheering and I was so happy with that HDR when I, I let it, you know, push a little further, then rederive it, reanalyze it, take a look at the SDR version. And I think I had one, one or two overall tweaks to make on the trims and it just, it brought it down just the way I wanted to. I felt like, yeah, whereas in the H, in the SDR version before I felt it was a little weak. Now I feel like even in the SDR, it's a better version of itself. And the HDR was a better version of. Now, all of that said, I still haven't seen this thing streaming yet, and I'm very, very nervous. I am really nervous about what I'm going to see. I, I just don't know what to expect. Well, one of the one of the tips that I've sort of heard, and sort of my experience in the some of the color grading at, at Dolby and Burbank is, you almost when you're done with your HDR grade, and maybe you have a new DOP or someone new to the process take a lunch break and go cleanse your palate so that you you now can come back and to your point single monitor only focus on the SDR derived and I, and I love the tip of just watch it down don't don't feel like you need to start tweaking it right away and yeah the Dolby Vision 4.0 mapping it's you know and I'll ask you guys this your your perception and how good it is and how close it gets you but what you'll find is, to your point, Patrick, you might end up wanting to trim a scene or a series of shots the same way to slightly counteract what that mapping is doing on those shots. And, and uh, you know, for a newcomer, I think working in the HDR and the SDR side by side can be challenging. But Joey, I really like your your concept of it is useful in certain circumstances. And both of you said that. Robbie said in a QC sort of manner to make sure your derived SDR hasn't strayed too far away. And then for some of that secondary matching of, of co tone, color, and saturation and hue, it, it, it presents useful ideas there. Yeah. I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, the hardest thing in this workflow, in any of this, this, you know, learning the Dolby Vision workflow is actually the HDR stuff, it's fun, it's exciting, and I, I, I'm willing to bet everybody listening to is going to have great results with their HDR master version, right? Like, regardless of what aesthetic you choose to have at it, that's fun, right? I also think that the downstream HDR versions, right, you know, a 600-nit, whatever, 1,000-nit version, the Dolby algorithm does an unbelievable job at those, at those versions. Like, I look at all the time, I look at on an LG, like my home LG, I'm like, wow, that 600-nit version just looks amazing. I wouldn't touch a thing, right? 
the hardest challenge for anybody in these workflows is getting that SDR version to translate, right? And I think, you know, I think depending on who you talk to, there's different approaches to this. I have found, you know, as and Joey hinted at this earlier, that the mistakes that we all made originally uh, sitting down to do this was looking at the monitor and just going, because we can, we're going to do it, right? And that, like, it, it just, it looked unbelievable on the HDR monitors. And to a certain degree, it looked unbelievable on the downstream HDR monitors, right? I think the balance that people have to find with this is that right now we still have to deliver for every place that's going to accept Dolby Vision. They want, you know, the other goalposts besides the HDR mastering grade is is that 100 net version, right? And finding the right balance that works for your particular projects, your clients' aesthetics, et cetera, in that grade takes some time to learn how to do that for that project. So if I had to give another piece of advice to people, you know, frequently in non-HDR projects or any any project really, we do some sort of look, look setting or kind of test grades for a client, you know, to get make sure that, you know, they're comfortable with how we're doing it. I would say the same thing really applies here in an HDR workflow, right? Do the HDR grade try these trims out, et cetera, before you're in the heat of battle having to deliver this, right? So you know coming into it where that balance is going to be because, listen, I've been there, Joey's been there, Dan's been there, Pat's been there, where that feeling of, oh, man, i got to deliver the show tomorrow, and I, I'm, I'm really unsure what's going to happen when I hit analyze, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to be there. You want to be in a place where you're more – you're comfortable where – you understand that the algorithm is going to do what it does and things are going to look great on the other end. And I think that's only accomplished by, you know, workflow testing and, and trying it out. Well, you know, this brings up two thoughts for me as someone who uh, you know, just did my first uh, Dolby Vision show. So how did I prep? Um, besides having spent a couple of years talking to people about this, well, what did I do? I went to the Dolby Institute website. I watched Joey and Robbie's 10 or 12 part series and then I, and then, uh, Dan, you did the same thing, right? And then um, I took AB's class, which is done directly through Dolby. And, you know, when I walked out of taking his class, I just felt like I was super prepared. Um, I felt like there are kind of stuff around the edges that aren't necessarily clear, even after doing all of this, and even after listening to all of us, when you get into the technical nitty gritty. And and he gets into that. And not only that, it's the most up to date information. It may not even be documented yet someplace. Right. And so, you know, taking that course, you know, two weeks before I was going into the actual color grade really gave me a lot of the confidence that I understand the tool sets and I understand how to do the analyze at the end. And I understood some of the, what are some of these controls? And he kind of, he walks you through first HDR grading, and then he walks you through Dolby Vision. And and honestly, kudos uh, to your team, Tom, for, for having that available to people like us when we're preparing to embark in Dolby Vision. And that confidence, I think, is super important because I've talked to, I've had, I've probably had, I think, three or four colorists uh, reach out to me over the over the last couple of years, and you know, these are colorists that I look up to. I look at their work, and I'm like, wow, these 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 guys and girls are doing incredible creative work. And they've come to me and say, hey, I'm I've got my first Dolby Vision job coming up. I'm a little bit nervous. I want to go in prepared. What can you tell me? And I'll walk them through everything I can and they go in and they tell me, yeah, I was, I felt more confident having that, you know, foundation to build on because at the end of the day, the art of making a creative, good looking image hasn't changed. We just have a bigger canvas to paint on, but there's that like 1% technical foundation that if you don't understand everything after that's going to be harder. I still think, you know, the craft, what we do is 99% creative, 1% technical, but there's new technical stuff that you just need to 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 dip your feet into before you're in the high pressure client facing situation. And I, you know, and I, to echo what both Pat and Joey just said, I think what's amazing about the new Dolby certification process that you guys have for end users, right, is that there's also the practical component of it too, right? Download a project, do the trims, you know, give us an XML that's valid. Learn, you know, run how learn how to run Metafire. Like, that's a lot different than just sitting here with a multiple choice, you know, test going, you know, what's A and B. Like, actually doing that workflow as part of the certification, I would encourage everybody to, I mean, it's what, a few hundred bucks, I think. I'm not sure the exact price, but, uh, you know, go 
go through that process, do that work, do the, you know, do the certification, you will have way more confidence in this process. And, you know, also I think it just, you know, it gives, if you're a freelance colorist going to a facility, you know, it gives that facility, uh, you know, a, a, a bolt of confidence that your skills are there, right? That you've taken the certification from Dolby to do this. And, you know, you're not going to walk into the suite and screw it up with, with a client. I think that's a key component as well. Yeah, I'll put a link here in the uh, the video chat for uh, people to see so they can learn more about the, it's really a two-part thing. It's a basically eight hours of training followed by a multiple choice test and then a practical test, um, which, you know, you, then you can get the certification. So it's it's $600 for both, but I'll put a link in so so people can check it out. This is great. I mean, any other final, can we do a round table final thoughts of, you know, you need to know this. Uh, I, I love I love your insights there, Patrick. So anybody else, jump in. Uh, I was going to say, the one thing I wish I could share with colorists is try more things. I, I look at so many HDR grades and I think they played it safe. They were too afraid to get the QC report that said, you did it wrong. Uh, when I did the movie, I graded it exactly the way I would. Uh, and luckily, actually, we were analyzing and delivering all the whips with Dolby Vision metadata. Everything went out, HDR and SDR. So I kind of had a slight safety blanket that if there was a major problem, someone would have highlighted it at the end of week one. But I, I do want to see people grade again, essentially. Like, I think there's a little bit of a clean look starting to emerge that, you know, people are not using their favorite LUTs anymore. They don't have the film emulation kind of curves. And it, it's a lot of hard work to relearn. You got to put in the hard yards yourself to figure out if I use this curve, it gives me the same kind of feeling that I'm so used to with a, a Rec 709 limited lot. Um, and then to kind of embrace it and, and learn how to use the trim tools to, to make the SDR match. It's just kind of like the, the biggest change, I guess, we've ever had in our careers. Like there's a lot of new things, a lot of new restrictions lifted, uh, and you just kind of have to be willing to push it sometimes. Um, and I think that's where I'm lucky that because I have, you know, the guys in the background giving me the technical background, I can push it and then even at the end of the day, I only have, you know, four QC issues because I've had Robbie and Joey and Pat saying, oh, if you do that, make sure you watch out for this and, and things like that. So. And do you all see a world where um, it's kind of to your earlier points uh, about testing and or practicing or, or playing around? Do you see a world where um, DOPs and colorists are partnering earlier before shooting starts, maybe with test shooting? with test images and they're basically checking that pipeline. Do you see that becoming more prevalent? So I just started a new movie where the DOP is monitoring HDR for the first time on set. So he has um, a 311K, actually, same monitor I have, and he has a DM250 side by side. And we had to build uh, LMTs for both. It's all fully ACES, so it was pretty standard, essentially, that we could match them. Um, but actually, funnily, like at the end of the first day, he's like, uh, oh, the SDR doesn't match the HDR because all the demos and examples we've shown have used the Dolby Vision workflow where everything did match up perfectly and there was no um, worries. So there's a little bit more handholding, but um, I'm very excited to grade this because it's essentially lit for HDR. There's no SDR monitoring and hope for the best. He, he kind of sculpted it based on what he could see. Um, and I hope that's how it's going to be from now on. Yeah, to, to echo that, Tom, I think that the the role of the DIT and, you know, onset colorist is more important than it ever has been, right? You know, thinking about, H, thinking about HDR and Dolby Vision as simply a post-process, I think is a mistake. I think that there's so much from, you know, gaffing and lighting and makeup and set design and all of these things that can happen when you go into it with HDR, you know, on the brain and having, you know, competent DITs on set who can can interface with post-production, can interface with a colorist to put LMTs or lookup tables or whatever they need to do, you know, to make that happen. Uh, just it avoids mistakes down the line, too. I think that, you know, knowing, you know, knowing, having an idea to the onset team what they're capturing there and not have it be a surprise when they get to, you know, final finishing and post, I think uh, benefits any production. Uh, just to add on to that, I would say that, uh, I mean, this has been a, you know, a 20 year process, I think, of getting colorists involved in the shoot earlier and earlier. Uh, I think it's still a work in progress. I think that the higher your budget, uh, the more likely you're going to do that that the more run and gun you are, the more that color grading is 
seen more as I'll, 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 I'll pick a colorist when we're done after we've got the edit locked and I'll worry about the color grade. And by then it's like, well, my choices are limited. Like I cannot help you choose a better recording format or choose a better, you know, transform or, you know, whatever it is. I, I just, I can't help you there. So all I can do is with, work with what's in front of me. And the real advantage of a DP colorist collaboration is that limitations I see, they can address. And then limitations I may be trying to impose, they can say, no, 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 don't do that. Do this instead. It will work out great. You know, it's a two-way communication. And uh, I think the more we can get that, uh, the happier everyone will be. But it's, in, based on my experience, still a work in progress. Yeah, and I, and I think also, you know, just to riff on that, well, my last final you asked, you know, about kind of what one kind of last parting tip would be, would be to not be afraid of the, the tech and the work, you know, like the, the deep dive components of this, right? I think that to largely understand the benefits of HDR, part of our process of colorists is being educational to all of our clients, even if we're not educators, right? You know, we, we spend a lot of our time educating, of course, but if you're not, I think we still owe it to our clients to help them make this transition. And those clients might be DPs, directors, producers, et cetera, right? And, you know, there is really succinct ways of explaining this process, you know, understanding basics of like, tone mapping, right? Understanding the basics of, oh, this is how your iPad Pro is translating this image onto the display, right? I think every, but all of us as colorists owe that to our clients. And I would also just say, just don't be afraid of the tech. I think to your guys' credit, Tom, you've done an amazing job streamlining, you know, this is a much different world in 2021 explaining this stuff than we were in 2017 or whatever, right? Um, and that's and that's to your guys' credit. And I think the last thing I would say is, uh, for clients to really buy into HDR and Dolby Vision workflows, they really need to see it, right? And so, you know, having clients in for, you know, personalized or live demos is one thing. Um, I, I, know, I, I don't know if everybody knows this. We've talked about this on our, some of our podcasts, but the idea of the, um, the Dolby encoding engine and some stuff that you guys are doing in the cloud workflow to actually make encoded Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos files that clients can take away and put on a USB stick or play on their iPad or whatever, that's a huge deal. And then also simply just making recommendations to clients. Like, you know, I tell clients all the time if they want a, you know, a subtle version of something to see in HDR that's not over the top, I'm like, hey, Check out Chef's Table on Netflix. It's beautiful. Graded by this guy's Apache in LA. Like, and it's, and it's a subtle, brilliant use. And they go, well, okay, what's about something over the top? And I pick, you know, three or four examples of over the top, you know, really in your face. Like, they only are going to get it once they see it. And I think that's our job, our job as colorists to facilitate that and to facilitate some of the tech uh, behind it and make it, make the tech digestible to them. Yeah. I mean, I think to echo what Robbie said, the, the, the tech is important. And it's not scary once you get past that little bit. Like I said earlier, you know, we're 99% artists, 1% technicians, but that art is built on a technical foundation. So the more you can to embrace and understand the technology, the better. But also, to me, the most exciting thing, I think, and it's something that Dolby's done very well from the beginning, because anytime you hear anybody talking about Dolby Vision workflow, the, you know, the description is always, we are trying to translate the artistic intent to the user's screen, right? Uh, what I think a lot of people don't really realize about the future of HDR and the potential of HDR in the industry is now when I pull up a show on my TV on Netflix or on any other platform that supports Dolby Vision is that I have so much better of a chance of getting something that looks remotely like the artists that made the content actually intended than this industry has ever had, right? Like the integrity from the mastering suite to the consumer with this workflow is so much better. That alone makes it worth embracing. Not to mention the fact that now the image can look a hundred times better, but just being able to say we are doing this to translate the artistic intent and you know all the technology all the geeky stuff that i love getting into aside at the end of the day it is an art form that we're doing here and to be able to give that to the consumer in a better way is hugely exciting that's great well i really really appreciate uh the time you guys have taken right now 
I again appreciate the time you guys take on mixing light and sharing your knowledge with people. I highly recommend if you're into this sort of thing, check it out. Um, you know, there there's great conversations like this with tips and and conversations where you're deep diving into these sorts of things. And um, I have to admit, I I had to steal some of that and bring you guys here so we could uh, we could share some of it with the wider world. But again, you guys are amazing. I really enjoy your work. I can't wait to see Dan's new show, Patrick's new show. And uh, Robbie, let's give a plug to uh, the show you guys just did together too. Yeah, I think uh, it's called The River and the Wall by director Ben Masters. It's a uh, more of a natural history outdoor kind of thing, uh, touring the... Uh, the Rio Grande River from the very uh, start of it to the very end of it and what uh, the ecology of that area is like, especially with man-made construction and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun, it's a buddy's trip down the river, but also at the same time, a uh, a scientific look at uh, what's going on with the ecology down there. So the river and the wall by director Ben Masters, check it out if you can. Cool. All right. Well, again, thank you guys. And uh, we'll be seeing you around soon. I'm sure. Thanks Tom. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you once again to my colleague, Tom Graham, for leading that conversation. And thank you to Robbie, Joey, Dan, and Patrick for your valuable insights into the work that you all do. If you'd like to learn more, you can find links to all of our guests and their work in the show notes. But before you go, please make sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We're currently working away on some big new episodes, which you will not want to miss including some groundbreaking work in a brand new medium we have not talked much about yet, but I think it's going to be a new vanguard in scripted entertainment. Are you intrigued? Then subscribe to us. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in our show notes, or you can just search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, thanks again for joining us. Sound and Image Lab is brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thanks again for listening.